Good evening, brethren, beloved. Welcome to another Bible study. Uh, God has been good to us, all of us, and allowed us to see another Wednesday evening where we can sit together. And of course, it will be probably Thursday when some of us are tuning in, but he has afforded us another opportunity to tune in to Bible study, to drill down into his words. We thank him for the privilege. We thank him for the, the opportunity. And I want to invite us to settle in so that we can be well attuned to where we are going to be going over the next couple of weeks. We are going to be moving into the book of Genesis, a powerful book, and it is important that we put into context the different things that we have been studying over the years, the different things that we know from the Bible, the different things that we have put together, that we have studied, that we have assessed and put line upon line to. It is important that we put all of those things into proper context. Now, many folks are unaware that if we are going to put into context salvation, if we are going to be put into context the fact that there is going to be a new heaven and a new earth, if we are going to put into context everything that we have learned, it is important that we go right back to the very beginning because the book of Genesis gives us a comprehensive background and outlines to us what it was that happened in the beginning, what went on after the things that happened in the beginning, and as a consequence of the things that happened, what were the remedial steps that were taking when we taken when we speak about salvation when we speak about sacrifice when we speak about all the things that we make mention of as it relates to salvation all of these things go back to genesis if we misunderstand if we are not clear on what it is that transpired in the book of Genesis, we are going to be missing out on exactly why some of the things that are done are in fact done. And so a study of the book of Genesis is extremely important. Uh, we will take time to garner information. We will take time in this study to build upon our knowledge base, but we will also see that the book of Genesis speak to us in peculiar, specific ways, and there is so much to gather, so much to learn from this book. Now, at the very outset, I would like to bring to our attention that there is a concerted effort by many, particularly those, those in academia, to discredit the book of Genesis. Why? Because if we can discredit the creation story, if we can discredit what many refer to as the fable of Noah's Ark, and the flood, if men can discredit and cause our youngsters, our people, to think and start to waver in their minds, if the things that they have heard about, being taught in Sunday school, being taught in Bible studies, being preached over the pulpit, that, you know, there was a Sodom and Gomorrah and God rained down brimstone and fire from heaven, and Lot's wife became a pillar of salt. And, oh, they tell us that those things are just fables. Just think about it, they would say. And what has happened over a period of time 
folks have started to question the validity, the truth, the historical factualness of the book of Genesis because those, the opponents of Almighty God, use Genesis to paint it as a storybook of fables. Out of nowhere, somebody just come and said, let there be light. Nothing can go like that, they say. Out of nowhere, somebody just come and say, a man used wood and built a boat, and then there was a big flood, and luckily he built the boat big, and two of every kind of animals went into the boat, and then the waters came and lifted the boat up in the air, and they say, that is just a fairy tale storybook matter that you recite to children when they are going to their beds. And so the effort to discredit Genesis has been around for a long time, and it is a strong, powerful effort and plan to try to invalidate and to make this book called Genesis appear to be fiction. Why? Why would folks go to that length to do that to Genesis more than any other book? The reason is simple. If you can discredit the source, the origin, that place from which all other things in scriptures flow, if you can discredit the genesis, the beginning, the origin of God. And when I say the origin of God, genesis is not where God started. It is where God stepped into time and started to do a work in time. So it is when we go to the book of Genesis that we first learned about God. But God was long before that, always before that, because there was not a time, there was not an era, there was not a, a, a season where there was no God. And so folks recognize that if they can hit at the heart of where the thing started, and cause our minds to vacillate and to start to think twice about the truthfulness, about the historical accuracy, about the, the chronology, about the reality of Genesis, then it would cause the feet of many to wobble. And everything else that came in scripture, which of course would have originated from Genesis because it is in that book that we learned about God's chosen people, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and everything. All of that was a part of the Genesis story. And that chosen people that came out of the lines of Abraham, when we go down to Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and then go through the rest of the Bible, everything revolves around that people and then those who came into contact with that people. Everything in the Bible speaks to ultimately the Messiah that would have come through the lineage of Abraham and then the work that he would have done for the Jewish people and ultimately the work that he would have done for the Gentile peoples of this world and the salvation that he would have wrought, the church that he would have formed, everything all the way down to Revelation has its origin in the book of Genesis. It therefore means, beloved, that if we can wipe the truthfulness, the validity, as I said before, of the things that are contained in the book of Genesis, then everything else is up for grabs in terms of how it can be torn to pieces and torn apart. So that one of the first things that I will attempt to do as we go through this book, through this this book of Genesis 
is to establish its validity, to establish the fact that the things that are contained in this book are factual and truthful. Because if we can do that, then we have solid grounds upon which to stand. Now, when we talk about Genesis, a lot of things come to mind. Yes? We know, according to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning, God. And so the first question that people would ask, where did God come from? Does the Bible have anything to say about that? And since you're in the book of Genesis, and it is in Genesis, the first chapter and the first verse that we learn about God, tell us where it is that God came from. Then we learn that he made all things. Yes. And then we learn that he created all things. Yes. How did it happen? I mean, could he just open his mouth? Could he just utter words and things come? Tell me, give me a breakdown about how the creation story expanded. Because those that are scientific and logical in their outlook want some thing that is tangible, want some things that can be verified scientifically. Show me the science in Genesis that will allow me to lean towards it being a solid book built upon scientific factual norms and I will then decide that God is for real. A lot of these things come to mind when we talk about the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2 now, chapter 1 and verse 2 um, says something else. It talks about the earth was without form and, and it was void. It means that the earth seemingly, from what verse 2 is saying, that the earth was there, but it was in a chaotic state. It was without form. It was void. So it was in a state of chaos, but it was there. Then if it was there and that was the beginning, where did it come from? In verse 2 of chapter 1, it is saying that the earth was there and it was without form and void. How does that reconcile with the fact that it was when God said, let there be, that everything happened? How come at this point the earth was already there? And we are going to go through the book of Genesis. And we are going to go in a way, first of all, that we capture the essence. We will do a survey of the book of Genesis just to provide us with a, a background to the book. We need to understand what was the scope of the book, what it was about. We need to understand who authored the book. We need to understand how you can sectionalize the book. Who were the, the persons, the people that were the early progenitors of the race that we call the Jewish people, Israel. Who were the other folks? What transpired that caused things as we know it now to be haywire and out of work. And so it is important that we get a feel of the book in a general way. And then thereafter, we will go into some specifics for us to see how deep this book is and for us to come to an understanding of the book of Genesis so that we can appreciate all the other books, all the other things that hinges upon our appreciation of the book of Genesis. And so questions, again, that will arise. You know, we say, according to Genesis, that creation would have taken place approximately 6,000 years ago. But if that was so, how is it that we are finding the fossils, the bones of dinosaurs which trace back to millions of years ago if dinosaurs were here millions of years ago and yet the earth was according to genesis 
people and animals and things were only here for about 6,000 years. How do we reconcile that? And there is always the concern, there is always the argument, there is always the uh, attempt to look at science and to look at the Bible, to look at the Word of God and try to see if they can be reconciled. Because if they can be reconciled, some people now say they have a basis to believe the Bible. If they cannot be reconciled, some people discard the Bible and then take up science and would believe the things that men have put together in science over the Word of God. But it is important, brothers and sisters, it is important, friends, that are tuning in, that we understand that God so set things up because if he wanted everything to be proven, if he wanted us to prove everything before we believe, he would have done things differently. But he purposefully hid some things from us. So although I started out by asking, where did God come from? And probably gave the impression that as we go through the book of Genesis, we will find that. No, we will not. God chose in his own way. And as we look through the overview, as we go through the survey of the book, which is the first part of what we are going to do, we will see, we will find that God just introduced himself. And that was enough for him. In the beginning, God created he didn't tell us where he came from. He didn't tell us a whole lot of things. He, and I believe God did that so that those that are going to make up their minds to serve him are going to do it on the basis of faith. Because we know that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. God chose not to reveal where he came from. Because it's, it's, our minds cannot conceive it. But he came from nowhere. He was always there. There was never a time when there was no God. And he just came initially from, where was his initial origination? There was none. Because if we say he came from somewhere, it means that there was a time based on our infinite or sorry our finite comprehension and capacity and ability to reason it would have mean that there was a time or it would have meant that there was a time when god emerged it means before that time there was no god but there was never a time when there was no god there was never a space in eternity past or will ever be a space in, in eternity future and we just use these terminologies, past and future, eternity, so that our finite minds can come to some kind of comprehension of the vastness and the extent of God and his ability, if that is the term, his characteristic, if that is the term, of being eternal. There was never a time and there will never be a time when he was not. And so he chose to enter into this space called time and show up and only tell us that God created and expects us to accept it. But can we? I'm going to show us that we can. And I'm going to show us why we can and we should. Many of us, all of us that nameth the name of Jesus and have received the salvation, we had to exercise faith, which we did. We received the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, and we partook of this salvation. Thank God for full salvation. Thank God for what he has done for us. And we are a part of the church of the living God. 
we boast about it that upon this rock I will build my church, Jesus speaking, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we stand firm and resolute on that because it was the words of Jesus. And if Jesus said it, then that settles it. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks because we know who Jesus is. And the Bible went on later on to talk about the apostles themselves and declare that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So that if Jesus can validate, if any of the apostles can validate anything that we are teaching, and since we are going to, we have started this subject area in Genesis, then what a great fact of faith and support we would have if we can show that Jesus and his apostles gave credence to the book of Genesis, it would clearly establish without a doubt that even though God did not tell us where he came from or did not for a lot of things put anything scientifically in place to prove it and he expects us to just receive it we are going to show that yes the Lord Jesus himself yes the apostle Peter himself who no doubt was the one based on scripture that was given the keys to the kingdom. He was the spokesman for the apostles back there in the first century. And if the apostle Peter who had the keys to the kingdom, who God gave the responsibility, the authority to open up the gates, the gates to the Jews and the gates to the Gentiles to allow them to come in to the church of the living God. If this chief apostle, and if the Lord Jesus Christ himself can speak to validate the book of Genesis, what a strong foundation we would have in supporting our claim, our position, that this book is for real, it is not a fairy tale, it is not bedtime stories, but it outlines the things that transpired in real life. They are factual. And if some of the things that Jesus and the Apostle Peter spoke about were right there in Genesis, all we need to do is to extrapolate backwards a bit. And we would then come to the conclusion that if what Jesus said was right, which it couldn't be wrong because it was Jesus speaking, then everything else, before and after the things that he spoke about in Genesis had to be correct. And so I'm going to invite us to turn in our Bibles. This is not on the screen. We'll soon go to our slides. But I just wanted to take the time out it's at the early parts of the, the, the lesson just to give us a little background, a little overview Yes, before we go into some other things so that we can chronologically go through and have a full understanding, a full overview, do a thorough survey of the book of Genesis. And then after that, that we start to drill down and look at some things that I know will blow all of our minds because many of us have no clue that there are some things in Genesis coming from the Hebrews, that when we start to drill down into them, my God, our minds will be blown. So I want us to turn to the book of St. Luke. St. Luke chapter number 17. St. Luke chapter number 17. And we want to go to verse 26. St. Luke chapter number 17 and we start at verse 26 so we go to 26 down to about verse 32 right and it is important that we follow closely now we turn to the scripture 
because we want to see Jesus' thoughts, how Jesus himself viewed his attitude towards Genesis. We are on the subject of Genesis. And if we are going to validate what is there, remember now, God just turned up, as we said, and said, in the beginning, God. And he just started to work all the way down the line. Then as we go down, we see things about Noah. Then as we go down, we hear things about Lot. Then as we go down, we hear things about Abraham and so forth. Could all these things be true? They were thousands of years ago. There's nothing to prove it. Why God just said, accept it? My answer is yes. However, we can indeed validate that the things are true. How? Let us read. And this is Jesus. We are now looking at Jesus' view, Jesus' position, Jesus' attitude towards the book of Genesis. And St. Luke chapter 17, verse 26. And Jesus speaking, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. Be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Brothers and sisters, Brothers and sisters, I want us to see a couple of things straight off the bat right here and now. One, I want us to note that Jesus himself recognized Noah as a historical figure a real figure, person in history. He said, he started out, and he said, as it were in the days of Noah. So he was, and to show that the, this was a real life situation, he spoke about the realities of life, how they married, they were given in marriage, they ate, they drank, they gallivanted, they carried on. He spoke about the times that they were in. He called Noah by name. But not only that. Today, men everywhere, particularly those in academia, the professors, many of those in the higher learning brackets, categories, they argue that there could be no such thing as a worldwide flood. They argue that there couldn't have been even a flood that was so vast that it could have. And in fact, they even go as far as to argue that this thing that the flood was so much that the waters reached the mountain and it carried the ark up in the air. They said that that is crazy. And yet, our Lord Jesus validated all of that event which happened in Genesis and said as it were in the days of Noah so he indicated that Noah was real a true genuine human being that has a historical place in the past he then went on to say that Noah entered into the ark. So all the folks who argue that this is craziness and no ark and ship could be built at that time that would hold two of each type of animals and, and they make it out to be crazy and use that as a basis to show that we do not, as believers, have the capacity to think and to reason. And when you listen to how they try to academically present what they call facts to extinguish what it is that we believe 
of Genesis to be so, we realize that it is an attack on all believers to bring down the Genesis story. Because if that can be caused so that folks are now wavering in their minds of the truthfulness of the book of Genesis, then it means that everything else down the line ought to be questioned. But thank God that Jesus made the comments that he made and validated the Noah story that he was there, the flood story that it happened, the ark that it was built. And if Jesus could make these statements, his attitude towards Genesis is that the things in the book are real. They must be believed and they must be accepted because Jesus was saying these are factual things. It was so at that time. And if Jesus said it, and we are believers in Jesus, brothers and sisters, even if you are not scientific in your background or in your endeavors, you can accept it as gospel because Jesus said the Noah story in the book of Genesis is true. Accept that. Let us read on. So verse 27, and we'll bring it back up on the screen because I want us to follow as we go through. Let us read on. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Now, likewise, now I want us to follow this also. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot. So this is much further down. And we are seeing that Jesus is back again in the book of Genesis. And again, he is validating as true and correct and believable the story of Lot. If we can recall, Lot was Abraham's nephew, right? His, Abraham's brother died and Abraham took his brother's son and raised him as his own and carried, them, carried him along with them. And it reached the point where they separated themselves at a particular point. And Lot went one way, Abraham went the other. And so Lot loved the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. Over that side, the grass seemed green and things looked flourishing and he went there. But after a while, Lot found out and he saw how wretched and how ungodly the people were and it grieved him. But there came a time, there came a time when God was going to rain down punishment on the people. And God told Lot, listen to me, leave out of that place because I am going to tear it down. I am going to rain down fire. I am going to cause brimstone to come down from heaven. And I am going to destroy that place. Now, folks have said to us, folks have said to us, this thing about Sodom and Gomorrah, up to this day, we cannot find the, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Up to this day, we cannot, you know, excavate through archaeological means and see whatever brimstone, because if brimstone came to this earth, it cannot just dissipate and go away. It had to be here. And archaeologists over and over have been searching, searching, and up to the last I knew, they were unable to find. They were unable to find the cities, the twin cities. They were unable to find the sulfur. But the fact that they cannot find it does not make the story untrue. And I want to rivet this in all of our minds so that we don't seek to believe Genesis on the basis of what men can prove. We must seek to 
understand and believe the word on the basis of faith that this is the word of God. And I'm saying this for all of our benefits, that this is the word of God and we are going to accept it. But just in case, you know, there is a little bit of imbalance in our minds because as humans, we love to have things validated, even if it is not altogether scientific. There has to be some kind of validating process. Well, who better to validate a point like this than our Lord Jesus? And here Jesus is saying to us in verse 28, Likewise also, it was as it was in the days of Lot. And notice, somehow the times, it seemed like everything that was in the past. And, and I've heard folks say it, and even the wise man Solomon as he went through Ecclesiastes. You know, there's really nothing new under the sun. So we are here in today's 21st century, and when we look at the decadence of the times that we are in, and all it seems as if is that people outside of Christ, all they want is party and a good time, and, and all they say being advertised for our young people is Smyrna ice and, and apple Lega beer and, and Heineken and party time and Negril White Sands and, and, and all of those stuff. When we look at it, it is as if we are in a generation that all the folks have on their minds is just to eat and to drink and to party and to. It was the same thing that happened. Look at Genesis in there in the time with Noah. It was the same thing that happened in the time with Lot. And look here, is the same thing is happening in the time that you and I are in. And it is important to note that every time it reached this crescendo, where it somehow come up before the nostril of God. Look at Genesis, you know, because Genesis is the, is the origin of things. And what was, will be, and, and I'm going to show us, I'm going to show us later on that we look at things in a linear way. There's a start and there's an end. And just, it's a line, one continuous line. And there's a start and there's an end. But you know, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, don't look at things in a linear way. They look at it in a cyclical way. Yeah, a kind of cylindrical way, a circle. And it starts here, and the beginning is the end. As it was in the beginning, so it's going to be in the end. And there is a saying that goes that way. And there is a rationale behind that statement. So they see things in a circle. Did you know a sign of eternity is a circle? If you talk about time and infinity, you start at a place and you go on and infinity means you go on and on and on. But then it is still two different points. A start point and a point that you cannot find any end to way out there. But it's one straight line going all the way on and on and on. And generally folks think in that linear way. But the Hebrews think cyclically. So there was a start, it's here. But they don't think straight in a linear way. They think cyclical, cylindrical, circular. So there's a start, but the end is right back where it started. So that when you start at point A and you come back around to point A, the start and the end is at the same point. Very important. We will come back to that later on in the study. But Genesis, the very things that were happening in the beginning, we see them happening now. It's as if the thing has come full circle, which is how the Hebrews think. And we need to adopt that kind of thinking and start to understand, understand things a certain way. But we will come back to that. But notice that same thing that happened in Noah's days happened in Lot's time. And the Bible said as we go on, and let us read verse 29 now. Uh, well, verse 28, likewise also it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank. They bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Now that is very significant because again we are seeing Jesus using something 
from Genesis that many folks would want to question. And he, by his own statement, his position towards Genesis is that it was real and factual because he pulled from it and made his point and says, just like what has happened to Lot, and Lot and Noah was in Genesis, Jesus is without a doubt showing, affirming the validity of what is in the book of Genesis. Now, one of the things that a lot of folks, one of the things that a lot of folks question in all of this story is, you know, apart from saying all that you have said, you know, apart from talking about Noah, apart from talking about the ark, apart from talking about the flood, which are, things are unbelievable, you know, come to Lot and you talk about fire and brimstone came down from heaven and God rained down. It. It's just unbelievable. And then further, you talk about Lot's wife became a pillar of salt. I mean, Bishop, truthfully, I mean, you don't think some of the things are made up? Absolutely not. Because notice, in his discourse, and if we look at verse 30, Jesus went on and on, and he declared it right there in verse 30, um, 32. And it's, 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 it's a verse by itself, verse 32. It says, remember Lot's wife. He used it to illustrate a point. That because her heart was at the place, no matter how she was coming out, she kept looking back because her heart was there. A lot of things can be taught from that. You know, people would have left out of that place where they were. People would have left out from sin and degradation. People would have left out from the world and the things that are in the world. And God would have instructed through his word, flee Babylon and flee the corruption of the world. And folks would have left. But a lot of folks still have that umbilical link to their past. Because they have allowed themselves to be moved by the glitters that comes from the system of the world. There is not that full separation. There is not that 100% disconnection. They still have an umbilical link to their past. So that when we see folks coming out and into the church, but there is still that love. It is what Jesus was saying about Lot's wife. Remember her? She turned a pillar of salt. Why? Because she looked back. The angels instructed, don't even look back. You're leaving your material possessions. You're leaving the things that you treasured while you were here. You're leaving a whole lot of things behind. And these are lessons that was in the book of Genesis. That a lot of folks don't look at and realize that there are lessons that are there in this one book. So not only is it the book of beginnings, origins, but within the pages, within the 50 chapters, there are things there for us today to go right back to and to learn. So we will learn, we will gain knowledge, and we will get spiritual insights for our today's living by just going through the book of Genesis. But the point that I wanted to make by referring us to verse 32 of the same St. Luke chapter 17 is the fact that down to Lot's wife, Jesus Christ validated. And we need to understand that what I'm saying is simply that Genesis and Jesus' attitude to Genesis was that he accepted and believed and drew references from the book. Brothers and sisters, we can believe the things that are in Genesis. Jesus said it. Now, I said earlier on that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So here our chief cornerstone, who is Jesus. 
Not only is he our savior and the chief cornerstone, not only is he our high priest, but he is also the God that received the sacrifice. He is also the God that is in charge of everything that happens so that this our God, this our high priest, this our Lord, Messiah Jesus himself, is saying the book of Genesis is real. So we, our, our chief cornerstone just validated it. And we see it in the scriptures that we have just read. But we did also say that the apostles and prophets. So let us pull for the chief apostle, Peter. And I call him chief because he was given the keys to open up the gates to allow the Gentiles and the Jews and whoever. He was the spokesperson that on the day of Pentecost spoke. And here now, Peter, and I want us to turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 3 and verses, say, 19 and 20. We start at 19 just to give a little, and then we go into verse 20. So let's bring it up on the screen, and we can look at the scriptures. 1 Peter 3, 19 to 20. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Hold on. I wonder if you see what, what is happening here. While the ark was a preparing. Hold on. I wonder if we see what is happening here. We're in few. That is, eight souls were saved by water. Brothers and sisters, the apostle here himself is now validated and confirming that the things in Genesis are true and they are real and they are believable. He is now confirming. So we started out with the fact that Jesus confirmed. Now we came, now we come, sorry, to the apostle, Peter. And he now is confirming. What is he acknowledging? That Noah was a real person, a historical figure from the past. And he is confirming the ark, which means he is confirming the flood. And then... You remember the Bible spoke in Genesis, you know, about the patience of God in the sense that he allowed Noah to be building the ark for about 120 years. So from the time that Noah started until the time that the flood came was 120 years. That is what you call patience and long suffering. That, in terms of the length of time, was recorded in Genesis. And if we look at the scripture in 1 Peter 3 that we just read, we see where Peter is also speaking about the long suffering of God in that he waited in the days of Noah. He didn't say how long he waited, but Genesis tells us that it was 120 years. Peter is corroborating and confirming. Brothers and sisters, we're taking time, you know, and we're going through Genesis because we want to make the point clear that the things that are there are true, they are factual, they are events that occurred in history, and even if we don't, and yet there are a whole lot today of scientific archaeological proof. But that aside, because we don't need that, if Jesus Christ our Lord, and if the chief apostle Peter can stand at different times 
and in their writings go back to Genesis, it is saying to you and I, it is believable and we must accept. And if these things that they have written about were true to the extent that they acknowledged them and gave credence to them, then it means, brothers and sisters, that we can take everything else that is in the book of Genesis, and in by extension every other book, because if we are going to understand all the other books, it is important that we understand Genesis. To understand the Bible, we must understand Genesis. To understand why things were going the way they were going. The sacrifices, yes, the, the ark uh, or the tent, the ark of the covenant. To understand why even in the end Jesus had to die. To understand why in the end times Jesus had to shed his blood. We can only appreciate it by going back to the beginning and all of that. You mean Genesis spoke about salvation? Yes. Genesis spoke about sacrifice? Yes. Genesis spoke, well, Genesis spoke about promise of? Yes. Genesis spoke about Messiah coming? Yes. Brothers and sisters, if we are going to appreciate the book, the Bible and the story and how although they go out and come in and intertwine themselves and go through all kinds of, of periods of war and fightings and failures and mountaintop experiences and valley experiences, understand that all that was happening is that they were going to one particular place and to understand where everything was going and how things are will culminate. We have to understand what happened in Genesis. And the fall. And the destruction. And the death. And the promise of everything coming back. To, we have to understand Genesis. And so we are going to take the next few weeks. And we are going to go through. And we are going to drill into some things. And we are going to have our minds and our spirits illuminated with some things that, I, that many of us did not even know is contained in the book of Genesis. And so that is very, very, very important. I would like for us to pull back a little bit because having said all that I have said so far, I want us to go through a little survey, an, an overview of the book, so that at least we have an appreciation for what is contained in Genesis. Yes? And then having reviewed and surveyed, we can then move into some specific things that will give light to where we are today and what is going to be happening in the not too distant future. So let us go through a little journey, a survey of the book of Genesis for the benefit of all of us. So let us turn to the screen. I'm going to go to the screen and take us through at this time uh, the book of Genesis. A, 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 an overview in terms of... In terms of um, a survey. Now, as indicated by its name, Genesis literally means beginning. It is a history of the, the origin of all things. It has about 50 chapters, and that those 50 chapters tells an entire entire story. The word Genesis itself is a Greek term and it means origin, right? It's, its Hebrew equivalent means beginning. And so it is important that we understand that. Within its 50 chapters, one can find the beginning of a whole lot of things, yes? The beginning of the world. We can find the, the human race um, beginning. We can find the beginning of sin, the promise of redemption. 
we find family life, we find civilization, we can find the beginning of nations, we find the beginning of the Hebrew race. Let me tell you, man, it is, it is the amount of things that we, the beginning of the universe, the beginning of life itself, the beginning of marriage, the beginning of sin, the beginning of death, the beginning of sacrifices, the beginning of governments, the beginning of music, the beginning of art, the beginning of agriculture, the beginning of crime, the beginning of languages, the beginning of tithing, that's giving a Look here, all of these things can be found in the book of Genesis. But the only thing that is not in Genesis in terms of beginning is the beginning of God. I said it earlier on. The book just starts out like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He at no time did anything to try to prove to us his existence, where he came from, how he emerged. And no, he didn't do anything like that. He just stated a fact. In the beginning, God. And so I am suggesting to us, brothers and sisters, if it is that we are waiting to find proof, because science these days, and I'm talking about deep science now, have been on a journey, on a quest to find what they call the God particle. They believe that if God is there, there have to be some footprint, some particle, something that shows the existence of this supreme, this intelligent being that we are unable to see and to touch and to fathom. And so some of the greatest scientists around are literally on a quest to find what they call the God particle or something that proves the very existence of God. Now, I find that to be very interesting because while men are doing all of that to, to prove that there is a God or to show that there is no God, God sits in the heaven and laughs because he chose not to reveal that thing to us. In days gone by, there was, an, and when I say days gone by, I'm not even talking thousands of years back, up to a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, folks were not worried about the existence of a God. Folks did not grow up with any understanding that there was no God. The concept of no God is a recent phenomenon. And I want us to understand that. And so God went through no pains to show and to prove and to cause men to see that there is a God and then bow and worship him. He just turns up. He just declares, I am, I made the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that's it. Take it or leave it. Thank God we were able to show and to validate that Jesus, that the apostle Peter, and Peter would have been speaking, representing all the apostles. They recognize the truth and the validity of everything that is in the book of Genesis. And brothers and sisters, so must you and I. Now, the author of the book of Genesis is generally accepted to be Moses. And if we read again in, in, I say in the book of the gospel... We earlier on read from uh, St. Luke. But if we go over to St. John 5 and verse 46, even here again, it is talking about, it is talking about and giving credence to the fact as to who wrote the book of Genesis. It spoke to, um, and it goes something like this, for had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Now, Moses wrote of Jesus in a number of places. He wrote of him in Genesis. He wrote of him in other of his writings when he spoke about uh, 
a leader that should come after him. He, he wrote about him in different places. But earlier on, Jesus spoke to Noah in the book of Genesis. Based on what we read earlier, based on what we read earlier also, he spoke of Lot from the book of Genesis. And so it is fair to believe that in writing about, in St. John 5, 46 and 47, he's speaking about Moses' writing back there in Genesis. Because in Genesis um, chapter 3, after the fall of man and a number of things that happened and folks were believing that, you know, they weren't sure what was going to happen. Here it was written in verse 15, Genesis 3 and verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head or the seed of the woman shall crush thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And that... We know, having drilled down into that scripture, all scholars accept this as a messianic promise. That when Messiah came, he was going to bruise the, the, the well, Satan would have bruised his heel, which we now know and accept as his crucifixion. That yes, he died, but he came back, he, he was not smashed, he was not crushed, he was bruised. Because yes, he died, having been crucified on the cross, but he came back to life. So he was merely, uh, you know, bruised. His, his, his heel was merely bruised. But it said the seed, her seed, the woman's seed, which no doubt is the Messiah, it shall bruise thy head, crush thy head. A head wound is fatal. And Jesus being Messiah, being the promised one that is here in Genesis 3 and verse 15, Jesus is saying, Moses wrote of me, and that is a fact. He was now validating and authenticating his messiahship. And we need to understand that. So here it was that Moses literally wrote about Jesus in Genesis 3 and verse 15. And Jesus is here corroborating it and saying that Moses wrote of me. So make no mistake about it. With all the arguments one way or the other, we have no doubt that Moses wrote because the books of the Torah, which consists of the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Number, Deuteronomy, all of these are attributed to Moses. And if the Torah is attributed to Moses, and Jesus is saying in St. John chapter 5, verses 46 to 47, that he wrote of me. It means that he's writing of him prophetically. And Jesus is saying that it was Moses that did that writing. So we have no doubt that the author of the book of Genesis is Moses. Now we can go into a discussion as to how could Moses write the book of Genesis when Moses was not yet born. And we can go into discussions of that. And I guess towards the end, when we will take some questions, because we want folks to start making questions as we get deeper and deeper and start to go into some things. I want folks to, to, to write questions so we can, and send them so we can actually address them. And I'm sure this will be one. If we accept, and if Jesus is saying, Moses wrote of me, which means that Moses wrote the book, how could Moses write Genesis when Moses didn't come around until Exodus? And we have answers for that. So worry not. So just make note, write the questions, and we will go into those. Now, the scope of the book is very important because we want to see what is covered in the entire book of Genesis. We want to see the kind of time frame, the timelines that are there. And Genesis itself covers the time from creation until the death of Joseph. Remember, you had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which are called the patriarchs. Now, Jacob had a couple of sons, um, the second to last of which was Joseph. And Joseph here, up to the time of his death, when we read in that last book, we realize that from chapters 1 all the way down to chapter 50, would you imagine one book 
and it spans a period of 2,315 years. Yes? And so that is, that is a very long time in terms of what is happening in just one book. And so we need to understand that, and this is why we want to take time and go through the book, because the time that you, can you imagine one chapter in a book taking 2,000 years? You and I have been around for 40, 50, 30, 60 years, all of that, and that, that don't even come in like one chapter. One, sorry, one paragraph of one chapter. And so we need to understand that a whole lot of things happened. But just to do a, an overview and a survey, we're going to look at it and, and we will see the main points, the main things, amen, that is contained in the book. And so chapters 1 and 2 talks about the creation. The story of creation is recorded in chapters 1 and 2 and all that we know, all that we see. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3 tells us that the worlds were framed by the word of Almighty God. Right? So what, what it does is simply outlines to us that creation was done and the things came about as a result of the word of God. It does not go into any depth to explain how and to drill down into all of those things. No, it does not. It just outlines that they were all done. They all came about by the word of Almighty God. And we need to understand, we need to be clear in our minds, you know, that that is who God is. That is how God is. He does his thing, and what he chooses to reveal, he reveals. What he chooses to keep under the wraps, he keeps under the wrap. And that is something that we must appreciate. Now, as recorded by Moses, we see the order of creation. We see what happened on the first day. He made light. And it's, it's, it is good that we kind of have a, a feel for this. Yes, day one, lights came. The second day, air and water. The third day, land and plants. The fourth day, the heavenly bodies, light in the heavenly bodies. Yes, the fifth day, birds and the fish. The sixth day, animals and then man. And then on the seventh day, he rested. So that's a sequence of how um, the, the creation unfolded. Now chapter 2 repeats the story of creation. It is not an account of a second creation because a, a lot of folks look at it and believe. And, and I'm going to, as we go further, because I started and kind of gave us a little uh, information that will suggest, and I want to keep it in mind, I want us to keep it in mind that there are some schools of thoughts and some different aspects of things um, in Genesis itself. And I will relate them to us in a little while. But I want us to understand that although we are seeing some things in chapter 2 as if it is repeating what is happening in chapter 1, that is exactly what is happening. It is, it is repeating some of the creation story. It's not a new creation. It's not a second creation but it is just repeating some of the same thing that happened in chapter 1. So you put chapter 1 and chapter 2 together, they are talking about the same thing and just giving an account of the creation story, right? Um, chapter 2 was basically retelling the account that was there in chapter 1, and it added some more details. So it is important that we find and understand that. If you just pick up your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 1, and you read through Genesis chapter 1, you see a sequence of things. When you go through Genesis chapter 2, you are going to see some things, and it looks a little different uh, based on how it is described. But all that is happening, and I'm just saying this for us, all that is happening, both chapter 1 and the chapter 2, is basically outlining the same thing. It's just that chapter 2 is retelling the account as to what happened in chapter 1, and it provides some additional detail. 
All right? And that is very important that we understand that. Now, as we go down, we see where God gave Adam and Eve the responsibility of dressing the garden and the privilege of partaking of its bounty. Right? The garden was the place where God wanted them to be. God placed them in the garden for a particular reason. God placed them there because most folks don't realize that God had a plan where ultimately he wanted to come down to be not staying in heaven where his throne was, but God wanted to come down to dwell literally. I don't think folks recognize I don't think many of us realize the depths of the love and the, the major plan that God Almighty have for us who are a part of the human race. Many of us don't realize, many of us don't understand the depths of it. And it is important that we do. And so God placed Adam and Eve down here in the garden, right here on earth, folks, Folks now ask the question, because as we go on, we are going to see that one, they were innocent. When you say somebody's innocent, you know why they were innocent, why they were called innocent, and why many see that this might have been a, a, an era where they call it innocence. Notice the Bible said that they were naked, and they didn't even know. It's just like they're, you know, babies. Uh, and you know why you say a baby is innocent? The baby don't know anything bad. The baby don't do anything bad. The baby will take, get up and take off his clothes and walk outside, walk in the middle of the road, if no vehicle are coming naked, and would be calling to everybody and smiling with them. He has no knowledge that he's naked. He's innocent. It was the same thing with Adam and Eve. And they weren't babies. They were big. They were made Big, right? So it's not that God did make a little baby, Eve, and they grew and became adults. And no, they were innocent in their mature, created stage, or made stage. And they, it was sin having come in that caused their eyes to be open and that caused them to recognize and become ashamed. Anywhere that sin is prevailing, people are always ashamed. And I don't want to get into the, the, the theology and the, the study, yes, and the messages into all the things as yet, you know. So sorry about that. I'm just getting ahead of myself in terms of presenting some of the things. But I really would like for us to understand God placed them there. He had a plan for them. He told them what they were supposed to do. He told them that they were to eat of everything, and yet he restricted them from one particular tree that told them that they should not eat of it. And God could have made them, so to speak, as robots, and made them in a way that they had no choice but to obey him. But God didn't do that. God literally allowed us, and this is the difference between humankind and every other of God's creation. Not only do we have the knowledge to discern between good and evil, but we also have been given the opportunity to make a decision on our own we have been given the opportunity of choice. And it is important that we understand that. And having been given the opportunity to choose, and God himself having spoken, now listen to how we are. God spoke, and then later on, see we are coming over to the fall now in chapter 3, we are going to see where Satan spoke. So God created man as a free will agent, gave us the opportunity to, to, to look at a thing, make a determination, then choose the way that we want, but he advises us, go this way. He tells us what is the right way and what will bring peace to us and what will be good for him, but he still gave us that free will agency. 
and what a God to do that. Why he did that, we have reasons as to why God could and would have done that, but we can't get into that now. But he, the fact is, he did that. But you know, while God told them, having given them the free will agency, and told them how to proceed, when they were in the garden, they listened to, they heard another voice. Subtly, the Bible said the serpent, which represented Satan, came and tempted Eve. And his temptation to her was literally to question the word of God. We must be careful, and I, I don't want to go ahead of myself either, even in this, but I still have to just make the statement. We have to be careful, brothers and sisters, how we question the word of God. It is a trick of the enemy. It is a plan of Satan. He is the author of temptation. He knows, he knows how to get to the mind through the ears and to get to the heart and to confuse and to confound people and to cause them to doubt the word of God. And so he came. Now, listen to this. How is it? And where did Satan come from? Because this is the time when they were in the garden, in innocence. They were in the garden and all was well. And yet Satan just come out of nowhere. Where was Satan? Where him come from? And we are going to go into that. Evidently, brothers and sisters, Satan was already here because he just turned up. So how did he get here? Because wasn't Satan supposed to be up there in heaven? Because he was one of the created angelic beings. So how did he reach here as Satan, as the serpent, to the point where he was able to tempt Eve? Where did he come from? And so we are going to go into that later on. A whole lot of things in Genesis that we're going to learn that is going to be unfolding before our eyes. But it is important to know that he was here because see, he comes to Eve and he too speaks to her. So God spoke first, Satan now talk and cause Eve to doubt what God said to her, to doubt God's word. And we need to understand this is how he always operates. Genesis speaks to beginnings. It speaks to origins. This is how it happened. And remember we said, as it was in the beginning, the, the, the Hebrew people think circular, in a circular manner. The beginning starts at a point and it goes in a circle and comes right back to the same point. Same way how it started, that is the way that he continues to operate. As we speak today, Satan knows when you hear the word of God. And in the same way, when Adam and Eve heard the word of God and embraced it, he then came and speak also. And he's going to do that and he is going to make the word of God seem as if he's keeping you away from what is good. He's going to make the word of God seem as if it is onerous and it is hard and it is difficult to fulfill and it is difficult to carry out. It is the mode of operation of the devil. And therefore, brothers and sisters, learn from the Genesis experience. As we see, he goes to them and calls them to doubt the word of God and speaks things that look true, but it is a lie. It is a deception. Follow the circle. It's coming right back around. And that to this day is how Satan treats with the people of God who God wants to bless and have said to us, listen to me. This is how you must proceed. These are the simple things you must do. I give you freedom to walk with me, but walk with me a certain way. And he gives us what that way is and how that way ought to be. And yet we allow Satan just like he always operates, but because we don't know. And so we're going to go through Genesis so that we can see principles, we can see things, we can understand 
what is happening, how he works, how he executes his plan to deceive, and it can put us in a position to uh, be able to retard him and to stop him in his tracks by knowing what he's coming with and knowing how to position ourselves. We have to learn to lock out those voices that are coming from Satan himself. And so you have to be very careful. But what happened? They, 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 they fell because they accepted the word of Satan and rejected the, the words of Almighty God. And God brought down judgment upon them. Every time that sin rears its head, every time that we allow sin to prevail, every time that we allow sin to get the upper hand, it is going to always bring down judgment from Almighty God. And at the end of the day, mankind was totally expelled from the Garden of Eden, the place where God made for them, the place where God wanted them to, um, to have offspring, to replenish the earth, because they were made in the image of what God knew he was going to look like. You know, God decided from back there in the beginning what he was going to look like, because he planned he was going to be here in the form of man. So that when we talk about they were made in God's image and in his likeness, this is in the image and likeness that he knew that he was going to have. He planned to be here and dwell among men. And so he wouldn't be God the spirit up there in his high and lofty place. Yes, he's going to come down as a man and he's going to still be in his high and lofty place and he's going to dwell among us and we are going to be there and he's going to be with the people that he loves. This is exactly how we know that God loved the human race because he decided to come and the form that he would take will be like a man, not like an angel, but like a man. And this is why even one songwriter said, angels have to fold their wings when they look at this salvation thing, you know, because they couldn't, couldn't and cannot understand what it is with God and man that he has made. That ultimately he was going to take the form of a man. When we get to heaven later on, you know, notice there's going to be only one throne. But guess who is going to be sitting on the throne? The Lamb of God. The man, the figure that he chose to establish for himself. Him coming in the flesh. He was going to keep that body. And that body is the only figure, the only person, the only image of Almighty God that you and I will ever see. No, and for the rest of eternity as it is. It is him. And he has taken on that. Though it is glorified. And everything like that. And he resides in that body. He has that physical body that you and I will see throughout eternity. God knew what he was doing. And so, Adam and Eve were expelled. Not realizing the great plans that God had. Not realizing the great thing that was there for them. And they got pushed out. And possibly Satan laughed but it is important that we understand that there is a full story that would have and will be emerging from the book of genesis he brought hope of redemption right there in genesis genesis chapter 3 and verse 5 and we quoted it earlier on and i will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his, his ear. And so we realize that the promise of a seed was to come that was going to destroy the works of the enemy, the works of Satan. And without reading the rest of them, we have listed some scripture there for you. That you can see that a plan is there and there is hope and salvation is coming. And the hope of salvation is also seen as God from in Genesis. He slew the first sacrifice. Now, a lot of folks haven't taken the time out 
to look deep and to see exactly what transpired in Genesis after Adam and Eve sinned. Even though God expelled them from the garden, even though death ultimately came into the human race because of Adam and Eve, a lot of folks might not have realized it might be easy to slip. And as we go through Genesis, we're going to be very focused because we're going to see a lot of lessons. And for whatever reason, God seemed to, to hide things so that those that are discerning and those that are serious and those that really want it can find it. But you're going to have to dig and you're going to have to search and we're going to have to search with all of our hearts. There's something about God because he said it even to the prophet Jeremiah, you know, they, they shall find me. But only after they have searched for me with all of their hearts. There is something about God. He has treasures galore. But so long as we dig and we persevere and we push, we will find. But if we just, uh, in a willy-dilly way, just glance over and gloss over, we are going to find that we miss so much. But I want us to understand that while Adam and Eve took plants and covered their nakedness, we find that God, after a while, covered them with the skins of animals. For God to do that, it means that an animal had to die so that their skins could be used to cover them. And in that little episode, we clearly see the first sacrifice to cover Adam and Eve. And if we start to go into other books later on, we are going to see that without the shedding of blood, without an animal sacrifice, there can be no remission of sins. It started right here in Genesis. So when we started out earlier and we indicated that it is the origin of everything we can think about, the origin of the universe, life, mankind, marriage, sin, redemption, death, prophecy, sacrifices, nations, governments, music, art, agriculture, languages, cities, and all. It is in Genesis that we see the first sacrifice, and it was a sign of things that were to come. Chapter 4 gives us the, the first civilization. Yes, as time progressed, Adam and Eve, Eve had their sons, Cain and Abel, and we know what transpired. Cain slew Abel, and this again, whole lot of things can come from here. But as we go on, as we go on, even though Abel died, and Abel represented a race that a set who, from whom, you know, he was the one that was calling on God. He was the one that had his sacrifice. Um, accepted and it caused the jealousy even though he died and then Cain was left and his uh, offsprings called not on the name of the Lord God was good and he caused Adam and Eve to have another son that they call Seth yes and after that men began to call again on the name of the Lord as they went on and as things transpired but in the chapter 4 we saw civilization coming down we saw the, the the offsprings on and on and on and until civilization started to spread out and that was how from place to place folks were going and being spread across the then known world no chapters 5 through 9 contains a genealogy of adam and it is important to note that it speaks to it speaks to all that happened right down unto the time of the flood. The same flood that we spoke about earlier. It is this chapters five to nine goes down and give us a good breakdown of what was actually happening. Now, as time continued, Seth the same descendants were influenced by the sins of their cousins. You remember now Seth had his children, but his brother, his big brother, Cain, who slew Abel, Cain also had children. So those two set of children were cousins. But what was happening, 
Cain's children were now influencing Seth's children. Seth's children were the ones that were calling on the Lord. Cain's children were the ones that followed into the footsteps of their father, Cain. And he was wicked and slew his brother. And his offspring were not um, following after God Almighty. And before you know it, the influence of those that were doing the wrong came over and started to influence the, those the descendants of Seth. And before you know it, the imagination of the heart of men was now extremely desperate. It had reached a place that it had come up into the nostrils of Almighty God, and we must be careful. I, I mean, I don't want to I keep saying it, but I have to just pull it every now and then. It is important, saints of God, that we take time out and be careful because you can have a set of people like the Setites, those offspring of Set, who call on the Lord, but there is a thing called influence, and for whatever reason, the influence of those that are ungodly can easily contaminate the influence of those that have a desire and have, are trying to call upon the name of the Lord. So what we are learning from this is that we need to be very careful and take the time out, brothers and sisters, to sharpen and to guard our hearts because you will have influence. Remember, these are from the same mother and father. They are, they are from the same house. Cain and Seth are brothers. Their mother and father was Eve and Adam, respectively. They are brothers, and now their children, the one that was bad, is now influencing the one that is good. It tends to go like that. And from the same house, from the same place, you can have folks with different mentalities, different agendas, different things. We must be careful. So as we go through, I, I admonish and charge us, look at what is happening in Genesis and learn to protect our hearts because this beginning is what was happening throughout the Bible. Those that were pursuing righteousness in a general way and in a general sense were always being troubled by those that were influencing them to do things that were wrong. And many times the negative and the bad and the evil influence overpower those that are trying to live right. And so it is a warning to all folks that call upon the Lord that you have to be careful. Be careful of the things that you allow to come into your space. Be careful of the things that you allow to come into your system. Be careful of the things that we allow to come into our general era. They will influence us for good or for bad. So take the time out and look at what happened in Genesis as it was at the beginning. Follow the circle. It's going to go full circle. And we need to understand that. And God was about to rain down judgment upon the earth. But that there was a man named Noah who was chosen by God. And through his line, ultimately, Messiah, Messiah would come and so it is important that we understand you know we said it earlier but there is something that we can draw from genesis 6 and relate it <coughs> to matthew 24 in in the instances that we read earlier both with noah and even afterwards with lot there was something that was characteristic of the times in which they were living. They were, they, they were generally ungodly. They, they, they were pursuing worldly pleasures, partying, gallivanting, up and downing. Even in the case of um, Sodom and Gomorrah, similar to Genesis 6 with Noah, but they were even worse. They were now involved in sodomy, which is homosexuality. And if we go over into Matthew 24, it starts to indicate the condition of the days of Noah and relate that they were similar to what was happening at the day that we'll, we will call days of the end time. A, a civilization that literally forsook God and ran after 
the pleasures of this life. The same thing happened in Noah's time. The same thing happened in Lot's time. The same thing that is we are seeing before our very eyes today. I keep saying it. I say it again. It is seemingly going in a circle. Nothing new. And Jesus referred to those times though they were separate and apart in terms of timelines. And so is the timeline now compared to when those things happen a far distance of time. But yet the similarities are frightening. It is as if the same spirit is around now and pushing people to do the same thing. And it's as if we don't realize that in the same way, when it reached to a certain point, God is going to step down as he did. And he sent the flood in Noah's time. In the same way, when it reached a certain point, God is going to step in and he rained down fire and brimstone in Lot's time. It is the same way. In this age, it is going to reach to a point and God is going to rain down judgment upon the inhabitants of this earth and we need to understand exactly what is at work here and so God God true to his promise he sent the flood and he destroyed the earth but following all of that he sent a rainbow uh, yes and the rainbow was the covenant sign that God will never destroy this world again by water and he renewed what he originally said earlier in Genesis to replenish the earth. And he started over with, with Noah. And so <clears throat> as we look further and go into chapters 10 and 11, just giving us a kind of broad span spectrum of the book of Genesis, as we go over into chapters 10 and 11, we see the dispersion of nations, right? As we go down, we see Noah had his sons. And listen, I want us to understand this. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and God started over so to speak with Noah but let me tell us how sin is and and this is you know we have to be so careful so as we span through and survey the book of Genesis we are seeing a number of things here it is that Noah came out of the flood a man that called on God man that found grace and God start over, so to speak, with Noah. And yet, this same man became drunk with wine, excess wine, and his own daughters went in and we have to be very careful we have to be very careful and Noah himself was naked and ashamed I'm telling you every time that sin rears its head brothers and sisters and we allow it. Just look at the survey. Here a, a, a righteous man. Here a man that God worked with. And was going to start a new, start afresh. A lot of hope. Aspirations. In terms of attaining to certain heights. Indeed he was a spiritual man. And this is how I repeat what I said before, that we have to be careful and we have to guard our hearts because this righteous man ended up drunk and naked. 
and his son saw his nakedness. That's shame. And ultimately another son had to come and cover him and all. We have to be very careful. We have to be very vigilant. We have to be on the lookout constantly because the best of us, we are still but men. And we have to do everything. And the, what we are seeing as we survey the book of Genesis is that God started a certain way. God have high hopes for us, but sin. And every time sin raises its head and we allow sin to have rampage in our sphere or our domain, it always has one end result. Being as we are ashamed and we are judged. And it happens as we do the survey, observe it. And Seth had his children, and, and Cain had his children, and they mixed and mingled, which he expect cousins to do, but the bad influenced the good to the point where the good became bad and judgment came. It always happened like that. So as we survey, pick up the lessons along the way. And we are seeing all of these things happening, all of these things emerging in the book of Genesis. As we, and I think I'm going to conclude because I really wanted to give us a nice little introduction, take a little time as we survey, and, and then we pick up and finish the survey next week, and thereafter, we move into some other areas. Now, if I can bring the screen back up as I kind of get ready to close off on, on this um, section, bring the screen back up for all, for all of us to see, then we would want to just look at a few things as we close off, right? We said Noah and chapters 10 and 11 gives a little breakdown of the dispersion of nations. Noah had three sons, as we, we all of us know, Ham, Shem, Japheth. And he prophesied that Ham's descendants would be servants, that Shem's descendants would dwell in tents, and that Japheth would be enlarged and dwell in the tents of Shem. So these are prophecies that, um, you know, was established from way back. Now, we are not sure because there is one set of, of researchers and scholars who outlines that Ham descendants became the dark-skinned Africans and the Canaanites. Um, Shem's descendants uh, became the Jews, uh, the Arabs, and Arabs, and have dealt with ten, and have pretty much were, they were do tent dwellers, while Japheth, the Europeans has been enlarged through world exploration and, you know, they dealt in the tents of Shem through the Romans, the Greek, and the English domination of the Middle East. So it is very possible when there, there is a set of folks that do these kind of uh, breakdown, they follow the line from way back and they try to look at the origins of nations and they go far back and they have come up with um, what we have just looked at to show you know, who were the descendants of Ham, who were the descendants of Shem, and who were the descendants of Japheth. And so pretty much in a broad way, what we have outlined that the Europeans and that those kind of Caucasians were you know, from Japheth and that the Jews and the Arabs, because we all know that um, Abraham not, wasn't only the father of the Jews, but I want us to understand that he was also the father of the Arabs. And so, whereas they are brothers, and all the war that is taking place between the Jews today and the Arabs, it is actually taking place between, between brothers. Because remember now, Abraham, if he had followed God's plan, 
as was also outlined in the book of Genesis, we wouldn't have what we are having today. But Abraham was told by God that you would have a son. Um, and God decided that he was going to give Abraham that son. And guess what? It didn't happen at the time. It didn't happen at the time when Abraham expected it to happen. He was told that, and Sarah knew because she was prophesied to, that she will have a child. It kind of sounds far-fetched because now they realize that time was catching up on them. At the time, uh, Abraham would have been about 75 when he got that word after he looked around and said that nothing was happening for him. And he said, boy, God, what about me? And God said, yes, man, I'm going to give you your son and you're going to be the father of many nations and all of those things. And he had the word and everything. But guess what? As they started to get older, not that they didn't believe the word of God, but it is how we are. And again, lessons to learn. And we have to just learn to trust God no matter how time might intervene. We have to learn to trust God because we see if we ever dare to help God in a particular way. If God say let him do it, let him do it. If God tell us to move, then we can move. But we have to understand how we are working with God and how he is unfolding things to us. But remember, Abraham's wife was Sarah. And when she couldn't have a child, Abraham went into Sarah's maid. In fact, Sarah said, Abraham, take her and let her have a chi child for you on my behalf. And so she was an Egyptian. And Abraham had a son with her, Ishmael, who was the father of the Arab nation. And then later on, Sarah became pregnant and she had Isaac. And he was the father of the Hebrew people. So that Abraham was both the father of the Jews and of the Arabs. So a lot of folks just did not even see or understand that. So when a Muslim person speaks about their father Abraham, they are right in terms of the Arabs. When they come and they say, my father Abraham, of course Abraham is their father. But they are not the seed that was promised and they are not the seed through whom messiah would come who through whom the nations of the earth would be blessed and so genesis kind of outlines all of this to us so it gives us the origin of nations and shows where the conflict between the arabs and the jews and everybody else how it happened and why it happened and where it genesis is where it all came from, the, the origins of it, the, how it is chronicled, we find it there. But as we see these things, don't just look at the story. There are lessons there for all of us. So we are going to stop at chapters 10 and 11. Yes, and we will pick up um, and probably make it a little bit more um, concise as we go into it next week because I want us to get a full overview a full survey of what is there in the book of genesis but it is a powerful book a book that all of us need to take the time as we go through the study and capture the information apply what needs to be applied to our hearts and live for god we shall see some things opening up to us we shall learn new things we shall be impacted by things that are right in the book we are going to go over to a little Hebrew and we'll catch some Hebrew language. We'll put some sentences together because the Hebrew that was the original Genesis, you're going to find that right within those words are messages by themselves. And we are going to see how potent this book, Genesis, is. And so with that, we are going to call it um, quits for this evening in Bible study. We thank us all for joining in today. And I say God richly, richly bless you all. God's willing, next week, same time, we pick up on our survey of the book of Genesis. And thereafter, we start to drill down into some specific areas. And we will see basically how and what God has 
in his treasury box that can and will impact us in a po positive and powerful way and allow us to champion his cause as we go through life, even today. God bless you. See you next week in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we come again before your presence. We bless your great name. We thank you, God, for allowing us to be in the homes, in the minds, in the hearts of your people one more Wednesday evening. I pray, mighty God, that the things that we have shared this evening, God, it will have an impact on all of us. I pray, Father, that you will let this word find a place in all of our hearts. Help us to take the time out and in a chronological way, in a simple way, in a consistent way, go through this book together as we study, as we try to learn more about you, as we try to gain more knowledge of the word and of the God that we serve. Father, help us. Have your own way and let your perfect will be accomplished in our lives. We give you thanks. We give you glory in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. God bless you. And as I go, just want to remind you, we are having a great luncheon. And even for those who will come a little bit later, we should be having your, your lunch and dinner uh, for this Friday, this and every last Friday, amen, of each month going on down. It will be our Faith Chapel luncheon. Eat out, you eat nothing that day at work. You don't buy lunch anywhere else. You buy it right from here. And it is uh, for our, and in, in re regard to our church building campaign, our acquisition campaign. So we ask that all of us do our best to support and uh, we look forward, amen, to us passing through 29 Lindale Avenue on Friday, picking up and just doing your part to help the advancement of the kingdom of Almighty God. God bless you. Thank you. And God's willing, next week, same time, same place for Bible study. In Jesus' name, praise God.